All right. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is John Martin, and today I'm going to be talking about a new type of neural network and its applications for gravity field modeling. And like any good technical presentation, I figured I'd start with a picture of a cat. Um, and what I want to do with this cat is, is a bit of a thought experiment. And I want you to just take a moment and think about a sentence that you would use to describe this image. Now, if you're like me, you'd probably come up with something like this, cat drinking milk. Great. Good job. Now I'm going to make the, the problem a little bit harder. I'll put a constraint where Describe this image, but every word in the sentence you generate has to start with the letter L. It actually took me a couple minutes to, to come up with something that I was satisfied with, but what I got was the little leopard licking lactose liquid for lunch. Um, now this is maybe a silly exercise, but the thing I want you to take away from this is that the information content of both of these sentences is identical, but the former is, excuse me, the latter is much more unnatural because I've imposed this constraint. No one, hopefully, no one would use this sentence in real life. So what does this have to do with gravity field modeling? Let's turn to a slightly more relevant example of the same exercise. So this is a map of all of Earth's gravitational perturbations above J2. And I want you to just take a moment to identify the interesting features. And you'll probably say, okay, well, seems like the, the Himalayas have some perturbations, the uh, Andes, some tectonic shelf boundaries, et cetera. And now I'm going to do a similar constraint. I want you to identify those features, and I want you to describe them using a spherical harmonic representation. Now, I took the liberty to do this for you, and this is what it looks like. You'd say, oh, wow, OK, this is a big, long equation. Um, but the real kicker is that this is page 1,411. It takes over 1,400 pages to express a feature like the Andes or the Himalayas in a spherical harmonic representation. It is unnatural for the problem at hand. So very similar to the sentence, the little leopard licking lactose for liquid for lunch, like technically accurate, but not the most amenable for the problem we're trying to solve. So the outline for this presentation dives into this problem more deeply. Uh, and it starts by looking at a spherical harmonic gravity representation. And then so we can juxtapose it with this new neural network representation of the gravity field. We do a number of comparisons between the two and then talk about some future work at the end. So what is the, the problem? Uh, I argue that gravity models today are not inherently compact. And what I mean by that is you need hundreds of thousands of parameters or coefficients to capture the dynamics of any interesting features beyond J2. And as a consequence, these models are expensive to uh, evaluate and challenging to, to fit in the first place. And the reason for this is because we're imposing analytics that are unnatural to the problem at hand. And ideally, we can find a better way. So to show this, let's first remind ourselves about the spherical harmonic representation. So what you see here is the gravitational potential represented through spherical harmonics and parameterized by these coefficients CLM and SLM. The more coefficients you have, the better the model. But every 10 years, you, you see that the number of total coefficients in these gravity models goes up by about an order of magnitude. So today we have approximately 4.5 million coefficients to represent Earth's gravity field. And a reasonable question to ask is, what does that get us? And that's what I've included here on the right. And I include this figure mostly because I find it funny. Um, because if you were to ask me how many parameters would I, would I assume are, are necessary to model a surface like this, I would not assume 4.5 million. Of course, this is a bit of a, a harsh comparison because this is heavily dominated by J2 and the point mass. So let's take those out and look at what's left. So here we suddenly see a much higher dimensional you know, perturbation map. And you could begin justifying to yourself, like, yeah, this probably means a lot of parameters or coefficients to represent. But it's still reasonable to ask, do we really need 4.5 million? Um, so to look at this more closely, we, we do a bit of a qualitative experiment here. So on the left, I, I have the ground truth gravity field beyond J2. And on the right, I have the lower fidelity spherical harmonic representation. Now, in this case, the models are the same. And we look at the difference. So the error at the bottom here is 0. Let's start with a, an actually low fidelity model, let's say 100 coefficients. And you see there's, there's no similarity between ground truth and the low fidelity model. So let's up it an order of magnitude, 1,000 coefficients, still not a ton of similarity. Then we go to 10,000 coefficients. And suddenly, we're beginning to see resemblance between you know, the Andes and the Himalayas, but the error is still quite high. So we go up to 100,000 coefficients. And at this point, the maps look pretty close to the same. But when you look at their, their error, the place where they suffer most are in these dominant perturbations. And just to stress this point one more time, like. These are the next most important things to model as a dynamicist after J2. And even with 100,000 parameters in the spherical harmonic representation, 
were unable to capture those features successfully. So why is this? And this kind of brings me back to the, the criticism I have of imposing an analytic form that is unnatural to the problem. So spherical harmonics is really just a way to match prescribed analytic geometries with Earth's gravity field. And what you find is, you know, aside from J2, none of these harmonic signatures are natural for Earth. So if I want to generate a feature like the Himalayas, I need to superimpose hundreds of thousands of these shapes and harmonics before I can get something that even closely resembles the, the Himalayas. Then to add salt in the wound, harmonic bases at large just aren't good at modeling discontinuities, and that's best exhibited through something like Gibbs phenomenon. So the question I'm interested in investigating is what happens if we relax this analytic requirement? What if we don't impose that the solution must be of the form in spherical harmonics? So to do that, I turn to uh, machine learning and, and artificial neural networks. And just as a brief recap, these, these neural networks work by providing some input data, in this case, the position, and some output data, in this case, the acceleration. And as you supply this network with new data, it begins updating the weights to learn an op optimal mapping between the input and output. And immediately, this is advantageous because it's not assuming any analytic form. This, doesn't, this isn't inherently trying to be a spherical harmonic representation or a polyhedral. It doesn't matter. It's just trying to find the, the most efficient way to get from one space to the other. And this by itself in its traditional form works surprisingly well even for gravity modeling. But uh, a reasonable critique of this approach is that training this network, the network representation has no knowledge of the underlying dynamics. You know, you and I know that spherical harmonics is a reasonable you know, basis to represent the potential because it's a solution to Laplace's equation. This neural network doesn't have that same knowledge. It doesn't know that it needs to be a solution to Laplace's equation. That is until recently. So last year, an applied mathematician came up with the idea of a physics informed neural network and says, hold on a second, we can impose that these networks are uh, a solution to Laplace's equation, specifically by injecting the differential equation uh, into the cost function. So what I mean by that is in this case, we're providing the input position vector and we're mapping instead of the acceleration to the scalar potential. And we know that the gradient of this potential gives us our acceleration. So we can take that gradient using automatic differentiation, a tool built into all ML frameworks. And then we can compare this generated predicted acceleration with the observed accelerations and update the weights accordingly. And in this way, we're enforcing that the solution, whatever representation the neural network comes up with, obeys Laplace. So that's a really powerful um, technique. And, and I want to compare its performance to spherical harmonics. So to do that, I train both of these networks, the traditional and the physics informed networks on about 100,000 data points that are randomly distributed between that circumscribing sphere of Earth and a LEO altitude at about 420 kilometers. And I, I put it to the test. I, I compare it with spherical harmonics in a number of ways, the first being compactness. And what I mean by that is how many parameters do a spherical harmonic representation need to model these features um, versus a neural network representation? So we start with spherical harmonics. What, we're, what you see here is a, a map of the error of a spherical harmonic representation as a function of parameters. And the blue curve here is the average error taken across this entire map. The green curve is the error if I just mask out the features. So these are the important, dynamically important parts of the map. And that's this green curve. And the red curve is the complement of all of the features. What's really interesting about this figure is that it suggests before you even begin to converge on these dominant perturbations, you need over 10,000 coefficients in a spherical harmonic representation. So ideally, we want to do better. Let's, let's look at the neural networks. So the dashed line here is the traditional neural network, and the dotted line is the physics-informed neural network. And while this might not look significant, this suggests that the physics-informed neural network uses half the number of parameters of a spherical harmonic representation to achieve comparable accuracy, which is an impressive accomplishment. Um, so it, it, this is to suggest that the neural network representation is much more efficient at capturing the gravity field than, than spherical harmonics. But a reasonable question to ask is, what about other altitudes? These error curves were generated just at the circumscribing sphere where these features are most dominant. What happens if you go to Leo? So does this accuracy persist at higher altitude? To test that, we train six neural networks. Um, the one important takeaway I want to share from this slide is that we try and pair the networks we train with an equivalent spherical harmonic model. And what I mean by that is, let's say we have a neural network that uh, has 20 nodes per layer and eight hidden layers. That equates to about 3,000 trainable parameters. 
the equivalent spherical harmonic model is degree in order 55, which has approximately 3,000 coefficients. So we try and have this one-to-one -one comparison between all of these representations. The results are as follows. So there's a lot going on in this figure, but in, in the blue histogram in the background is the training data distribution as a function of altitude. So uniformly distributed or randomly distributed from you know, zero to, to Leo. The dashed line is the spherical harmonic representation error curve. So we just talked about the degree in order 55 field, and that's this dashed green line. And the solid lime green is the neural network representation. And what you see is that neural networks outperform the spherical harmonic models all the way up to 100 kilometers. So it generalizes with some level of success. Um, there does come a point where the spherical harmonics begin outperforming the neural networks. But at these altitudes, the features attenuate such that you could almost argue it doesn't matter. But well, that, that's still a, a fair point. So let's let's just uh, stop it and acknowledge the fact that it generalizes well from zero to 100 kilometers, or better than spherical harmonics. The next test is in regression. So how quickly does a neural net capture these features versus a spherical harmonic model? What I mean by that is, is the comparisons we've done thus far are slightly unfair. Um, specifically, the spherical harmonic model that I'm testing against you can assume was fit with an infinite amount of data for the sake of discussion. And what I mean by that is it include data from former gravity models, satellite data, ground-based measurements, and, and the fanciest you know, processing algorithms to achieve a, a very high order fit. The neural networks, in contrast, are only trained on 1 million data points. So a, a more fair comparison is what happens if I fit a spherical harmonic model to the same amount of data as a neural network model? How do they equate? And immediately, this is kind of an interesting problem because Harmonic bases are really actually quite hard to fit in. There, there are certain requirements that you sample, your data is sampled regularly enough that you prevent aliasing you know, higher order frequencies. So that provides a, a disadvantage for the spherical harmonic representation that the neural network does not suffer. Uh, neural networks just need sufficient amount of data that is diverse to learn these features. It doesn't matter what distribution is provided in. So uh, with that, we, we fit a spherical harmonic model and a neural network model to 10,000 randomly generated data. And what you see is that the neural network models are about 20% more performant than the spherical harmonic models when trained on the same data, which suggests that the neural networks are gonna be much more efficient at acquiring a gravity field from fresh data as opposed to a spherical harmonic fit. So I, I've been uh, poking fun at spherical harmonics this whole time. It's only fair I give it a break and, and move on to a different representation, which is the polyhedral gravity model. So to test the polyhedral gravity model against the neural networks, I generate four shape models um, of the asteroid Eros, and I generate 100,000 data points from the surface of this body to about 10 kilometers in altitude, and then I train two networks. And I look at the same sort of characteristics as I did for Earth. So in terms of compactness, the polyhedral gravity model, the more parameters you include in that model, the uh, better it performs. But the impressive thing is these neural networks are an order of magnitude more compact for the same level of, of accuracy. So the neural networks are looking good in, in competition with uh, the polyhedral representation. Similar stories for the generalization. Uh, in this case, the neural networks consistently outperform the uh, polyhedral model. And then as a little extra test, we, we look at how fast these models are to evaluate. They, they seem to have advantages in compactness and generalization and regression, but can you actually use them in practice? Uh, are they efficient enough to run? And the results are encouraging. So. When we look at the evaluation time to, to simulate 10,000 data points using each of these gravity models uh, versus a function of parameters in those models, we find that the absolute slowest is the polyhedral model. The gravity model with the steepest gradient is spherical harmonics, so it becomes more expensive to compute the more parameters you have. The consistently most performant gravity model is the neural network representation performed on the GPU. So, this is to suggest it has all of the you know, advantages. It has compactness, regression, uh, generalization, and speed. And the reason that these results are so exciting is that all of these networks were trained with no user optimization. There was no massive hyperparameter you know, optimization effort. Um, it only had one physics-informed constraint applied. And this is all to say that with a little bit more tuning, I suspect these networks can pack a, a, a much more of a punch um, with additional effort. So that gets into the future work of trying these additional optimization efforts, um, adding additional physics and form constraints, and then doing uh, more characterization about performance. Uh, but with that, I'm going to leave you with a, a chart that kind of highlights the advantages and disadvantages of the different representations. And I, I hope to see you in the Q&A. Thank you.